Hello, hello. Welcome to our first series of Ignite Talks. I love Ignite Talks. Um, I'm really excited to kick them off today. Please introduce yourself in the chat. I hope you've been having a phenomenal Seesaw Connect so far. We are so happy you're here with us today. <gasps> oh, Bermuda. Welcome, Nicola. Elizabeth from LaGrange, Illinois. Welcome. Make sure to tell us your role to Saudi Arabia, Vermont, LA. It is so fun uh, getting to connect with teachers and school and district leaders from all around the globe. It is really incredible. And we are so, so happy you are spending your day with us. So I'm Emily from the Seesaw team. And as I mentioned, I am so excited to launch our first series of Ignite Talks. We're going to have another round tomorrow. In just five minutes, each of these innovative educators will share quick and powerful strategies that you can implement immediately. So these are a little different than our other sessions. Each presenter is going to have five minutes to share with you. During this session, we encourage you to take notes, share insights, and be really active. Remember, by being active, you are earning points for the leaderboard. In the top right, you'll see the chat that is for sharing and connecting. If you'd like to use closed captionings, you are more than welcome. Make sure to stay the whole time so you can get your PD certificate. And we are going to be having another Seesaw Gear giveaway. All right. I am so excited to hand it over to our first presenter, and I hope you enjoy. Hello there, and welcome to Creating Seesaw Scavenger Hunt. I am Lainey Rogers. I am the elementary instructional technology coach for my school district in South Carolina, and I work with 12 elementary schools. And a question that I hear a lot is, how can I help my students apply their learning in the real world? And that's something we all want. We don't want them to just have theoretical knowledge. We want them to know how to use it. So my answer to that is Seesaw Scavenger Hunts. So why Seesaw Scavenger Hunts? Well, first, you can find real life examples. The kid needs to know what a square is. Well, what's a square? There it is. They found it in real life. Another reason why, you can scaffold support for all learners. Do the kids need audio directions? Do they need an explanation, an example? You can put that in Seesaw. And then kids who need all kinds of supports or the lack thereof can participate. And another reason why, you can use Seesaw's multimodal tools to learn more about students' understanding. These girls here have completed their scavenger hunt and they are recording each other explaining why they took the pictures or videos that they took. So ideas for Seesaw scavenger hunts. There are so many possibilities. You could use it at the beginning of the year and have students find locations around the classroom. You could have kids find basic colors in preschool or more sophisticated colors in art class. You can have kids find letters around the room or the school, find different 2D or 3D shapes and geometry at all kinds of math levels, have students find specific lab equipment in, sci in the science lab, or have kids model different facial expressions when learning about emotions or character traits, or have kids find or create different moods around the school or in the classroom. There are endless possibilities. So practically, how do you do this? Well, first, choose the topic or standard that you want your scavenger hunt to cover. Next, decide, is your scavenger hunt going to be a pretest? Is it going to be a formative assessment while the students are learning about the concept? Or will it be a post-test to evaluate what they have learned at the end? Or is your scavenger hunt just going to be for fun? Next, set up the scavenger hunt with frames. I love frames. So you can choose to have pictures. You can choose to have videos. You can choose voice recordings or a combination of all of them. This is another way you can scaffold by determining what kinds of frames your students need. Next, assign it in Seesaw to your students. Then go over the expectations. 
How do you expect them to complete the scavenger hunt? What kind of work do you want to see from them? And what kind of support should they expect from you? Then gather some volunteers. I recommend some parents or some other members of your school community and go scavenging. It's a lot of fun, but extra adults are good. So in my experience, we only have Seesaw kindergarten through second grade in my district. So I have done hunts with pre-K and with kindergarten, but they have primarily been math-based. So different kinds of shapes and counting, one-to-one -one correspondence. So one group that I went with, they were finding shapes. A hexagon was not one of the shapes that they were supposed to find, but a kid noticed this shape and asked me what it was. So I told him it was a hexagon. And as we searched through the school for other shapes, he kept finding hexagons. And it was really neat because he was so excited and he'd added some learning to himself because he really saw the thing in real life and it meant something to him. So I love that. All right, so in conclusion, we have very quickly discussed why you should do a seesaw scavenger hunt, some possibilities for seesaw scavenger hunts, and basically how you can do a seesaw scavenger hunt with your class. This here is an example an early example of a, a seesaw scavenger hunt 3D shapes that I did with students. This handout that you should be able to get will link you to those early seesaw lessons. Please feel free to get those and modify them. Please make them better because these were just very early samples. Thank you. I am Lainey Rogers. If you would like, um, we can connect on X, Twitter. I am at Coach L Rogers. And then I also have an EdTech YouTube channel called EdTech Lane. If you try a seesaw scavenger hunt, please be sure to tag me on Twitter and let me know how it goes at Coach L. Rogers. So now go off and enjoy finding things IRL. Thanks. Hi Seesaw Connect. Thank you so much for joining me today for my Ignite session called Using Assessment Data to Guide Literacy Instruction. My name is Hannah Erian Frake. I am a third grade teacher with a little over 16 years of classroom experience. I am also the letters facilitator for my school district and a self-proclaimed science of reading nerd. I wanted to share with you today about literacy assessment because if you are someone who works with students teaching them how to read, you are going to be more effective if you're using assessment data to inform your instruction and to inform your decision making. I know that the world of literacy assessments can be super overwhelming, so I'm hoping to give you a little bit of clarity today. All of what I share with you does fit within an MTSS model. MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support and it is a framework for providing literacy instruction and intervention that is designed to prevent reading failure. I'm going to talk to you about three types of assessments. The first is screening assessment. That is assessment that you give to all students. It is quick to give. Um, it is efficient to give to everybody. It provides you a snapshot of a student and it is meant to be predictive of reading success or reading failure. It's a little red flag that tells you who you need to look at further. After screening assessment, you're going to pull out some diagnostic assessments. These are for some kids, the kids who had red flags. They're more lengthy to administer, but they do provide you really detailed information about a student's skill level. They help us decide where we need to start intervention for specific students. And third, progress monitoring assessment. This is assessments that, that students receive if they are in an intervention and it should align to the intervention they are receiving so that it can help us to evaluate the effectiveness of the intervention we are providing for that student. When I am thinking about how these assessments fit together, I have a flow chart that I think through. Start up at the top left with that yellow star and we know that all students get the screening assessment. And after the screening assessment, we're asking ourselves, did they meet grade level expectations or not? If they did meet the grade level expectations, then they are good to go with their core tier one curriculum and any potential enrichment opportunities that you're able to provide. If students did not meet grade level expectations on the screening assessment, then we dive into diagnostic assessments so that we can find the student's low, lowest level of need. We use this information to plan our intervention. We can be efficient by grouping students together who have similar needs. And then we're going to use progress monitoring data to decide if the intervention we're providing is working for students or not. 
Here are two examples of screening assessment data or assessment tools that are both free and easy to use. A Cadence K6 is my favorite and Dibbles Next is a close second. Some diagnostic assessments that I love to use um, are listed here on this page. With a diagnostic assessment, you wanna think about what information you need to know about that student and then you're gonna pick the diagnostic that will tell you that information. You're, if you're wondering about their phonemic awareness skills or their phonic skills, their spelling or their comprehension, there are lots of awesome and free diagnostic assessments you can use. And finally, here is a list of some good progress monitoring assessments. Um, I love using a Cadence because it's easy and I know how to use it, but other districts have other options available to them. Remember that your progress monitoring tool should match the intervention you're providing so that you can measure the student's response to intervention. So if I am providing a phonics intervention, I want to use a phonics progress monitoring tool to make sure that they are making progress. With all of this good data that you've collected, you're now set up to make really good data-based decisions. You can decide if there needs to be adjustment to, to core tier one instruction in your district. You can plan student intervention groups. You can choose the interventions that are best fit to each student or group of students. And you're able to evaluate if that intervention is working. Here are some of my favorite ways for adjusting intervention if your progress monitoring data shows that it is not working very well. You can increase time or frequency where you are seeing students for a longer time or more often. You can reduce the group size, so work um, more one-on-one -on -one if possible. You can add more repetitions, my favorite, more opportunities for students to respond and do the hard work. And you could try changing the adult or the intervention. Find a more specialized adult or find a more intensive intervention. Here are my free favorites. If I had to choose, they're there for you to, to take. Um, and then a, a page just full of resources for learning about more. Please feel free to reach out. This was Fast and Furious. And if you have questions or want to chat, you can find me on social media at Reading with Mrs. If or on my website or through email. Thank you so much, Seesaw Connect. Welcome, educators. Unleash the power of Seesaw for your ELL students. I'll show you how to boost their confidence, build language skills, and give them a creative platform to shine. I'm Wanda Adams, an instructional technology integrationist. Are you frustrated? seeing your ELS students struggle to find their voice in class? Here is how we can utilize Seesaw's multimedia tools to amplify students' voice. Let's get started. Let's acknowledge the challenges ELS students face when it comes to speaking up in class. They might feel anxious about making mistakes or have limited vocabulary, or simply not be comfortable expressing themselves in a new language. Seesaw is a powerful platform that can transform your classroom into a space where ELS students feel comfortable taking risks and expressing themselves. Storytelling is a fantastic way to build confidence in ELS students. Seesaw's recording capabilities allow them to narrate stories at their own pace. Adding visuals helps them express themselves more effectively. Want to boost learning? Try this! Combine Seesaw with Newsella. Students read articles, then use Seesaw to make summaries or even argue their points. It's like a fun way to build reading and thinking skills. Level up learning with Seesaw and Stop Motion. Students can build animations like a flower blooming, then explain it with voiceovers, captions on Seesaw. It's science or any subject brought to life. ELL students take charge. Seesaw lets them track their speaking with rubrics. Think fluency, pronunciation, vocabulary. They can set goals and reflect on their progress, celebrating their wins along the way. 
As an educator, I've seen firsthand how these tools can transform shy ELL students into confident speakers. One of my students went from being unmotivated in class to leading a group discussion within months. Empower ELL voices in Seesaw. Build confidence, language skills, and teamwork with these strategies. Create engaging activities and watch students shine. This word cloud visually summarizes the key benefits of using Seesaw with ELL students. It highlights the various aspects of language learning and development that Seesaw can support. Seesaw boosts teamwork. Students collaborate on projects, practice speaking, and get feedback with comments. It's learning together made fun. To summarize, Seesaw empowers ELS students by providing interactive tools for speaking practice, facilitating app smashing for enriched learning, and encouraging collaborative projects. Seesaw supercharges ELL learning. Find lessons, templates, and tips in their library and help center. Plus, connect with other teachers for even more ideas. Thank you for your time and attention. Feel free to connect with me for more ideas and resources. Let's con re continue this journey together. Let's empower every student to speak confidently. Your actions today can make a world of difference for them. Here are some additional resources to get you started. Let's keep the conversation going and share our successes. The teacher resource page has a plethora of resources to support all stakeholders. Upskill yourself and become a Seesaw Pioneer. Thank you. Welcome to Student Empowerment with Inclusive Design, a Seesaw Ignite Talk. My name is Bridget Castelluccio, and I'm a digital learning consultant. To get the resources, please feel free to access the bit.ly. Student Empowerment. Oftentimes we think more about engagement, but engagement is what you as the teacher can do for your students where empowerment is about helping students to figure out what they can do for themselves. The Universal Design for Learning UDL framework from CAST strives to create a learning environment where all students become expert learners. Katie Novak in her UDL Now says empowerment is the ultimate goal of UDL. UDL educators have three beliefs. Variability is the rule, not the exception. All students can work toward the same firm goals and grade level standards, and all students will become expert learners if barriers are removed. A framework is a set of principles, beliefs, and values that guide our work. So the UDL framework has three pillars. The, it is based on brain research. The effective network is the why and its engagement. So for expert learners who are purposeful and motivated, we stimulate their interest and motivation for learning. With the recognition networks, the what of learning, the pillar of representation, to create resourceful and knowledgeable learners, we present information and content in different ways. And the strategic network, the how of learning, is the action and expression pillar. To create strategic and goal-directed learners, we differentiate the ways that students express what they know. So how do we design instruction with UDL mindset? I will be using examples from an Esperanza Rising CESA activity, which you have access to. Engagement pillar is about how you're inviting students to be active participants in the learning process from the get-go. These are the components within that pillar to check for. And as you can see with my future examples, I have achieved all of the engagement. It is important to connect pre-reading and learning objectives. So I have a video to meet the author to connect the students with the personal history and background information of the author. And then they have a way to respond, choosing again, a choice of text, video, or audio always going back to my object objectives of ELA standards. I also have created some ways for them to connect with themes within the book. Again, my firm goals for my ELA standards, but also interest in what they seem to think about is a connection. So this is about important decisions. Again, with that option of how do you want to respond, text, record your voice, or video. 
Within each of these, I am motivating them to be involved in the work, keeping in mind the firm goals and hoping that they will um, make those choices based on their needs. Representation defined. This pillar is about how you're sharing information and creating opportunities for students to construct meaning. With my checklist, I have achieved almost all of the components within representation. I have different ways to display the materials. In each of my slides, I always add the audio. In this, they're also going to engage in the first chapter by watching a video of the author read the chapter. They will have access to the audiobook as well as the physical print. Then we are going to emphasize sketch noting and using drawing tools on the, on the next slide so that they can use that visualization to represent and make connections. I also realized the barrier would be understanding the setting in Mexico. So I've added some detail where I've read this slide they have access to the Britannica Kids article on this location in Mexico, which is an immersive reader, and they can see pictures and videos of that. Again, they'll have that choice to type in a response of a fact they've learned. Another barrier I realized was that with the many Spanish words in this book, they would have some challenges connecting those. So I've embedded a Quizlet. The Quizlet has an immersive reader. It will read the English words, the Spanish words, and give definitions and read those as well. The action and expression pillar is about how we're supporting students to navigate and organize information and demonstrate their knowledge in a way that's respectful to them as a learner. Within this component, I can use Seesaw and my activities to check all of the action and expression components. It's important to have them understand the vocabulary. This also is part of that representation as well as in the action and expression. They're able to go to an outside link for a dictionary that reads the definition and the word to them. And then I'm allowing them some choice to bring down two of the words. I've included the page numbers so they could find those in the text and then asking them either to take a picture or to do a drawing with the drawing tools to express their understanding of that word. In relation to the goal of learning about themes of books, I have encouraged them to consider their own definition of courage, thinking about someone um, who has courage and what difficulties they might have faced, and allowing them three different ways to express their learning. Also on the side, I've highlighted how important it is for the Seesaw slides and pages to be in a sequence that allows students to naturally move through those um, activities in a way that makes sense and is easy for them to navigate, oftentimes using icons or symbols to allow them to know what parts they should be doing. So what will be your next steps? Katie Novak in the Shift to Student-Led says the power of UDL is in recognizing variability, articulating firm goals, and shifting decision-making to students to foster that expert learning. That's empowerment. So here's a few resources to consider using along the way. The first one is the UDL guidelines at cast.org. This is the two Point two version, there will be a 3.0 version coming soon. The draft is in process. I also have a UDL tech tool audit that I use that has that checklist for each of the three pillars, engagement, representation, and action and expression. Again, through the bit.ly and the resource doc, you can access this. This will help guide that inclusive design for you to empower your students and see where you are um, reaching the three pillars. Seesaw also has just released an evaluation guide as well, which can help guide that inclusive design and student empowerment. Thank you for engaging with student empowerment and inclusive design. Feel free to reach out to me for more information and resources. Welcome to Quick Checks with Exit Tickets. My name is Erin Rocklowitz. I've been an early childhood educator for the past 20 years. I teach kindergarten in a small suburb outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm so glad that you're here. I just have so much time to check in my students, said no teacher ever. I don't know about you, but I'm constantly running around trying to figure out how to get my students data, how to best fit their needs, but sometimes I can't always get to them. So my solution, exit tickets. Exit tickets are one to three questions depending on the lesson that you want to know. So here's a couple of examples that I use. So on the, we use bridges in my school district. So there's one about 2D shapes and 3D shapes, simple enough for kindergartners to do, colored in, easy to do. The other one, you can see that the students had to write the numbers that come before and after. My student had a little bit of issues writing the numbers and they weren't 
they were confused about it. So we sat together and did it. Both of these I made on just an easy word program, copied and pasted them and put them up on Seesaw, or you don't even need to put them on Seesaw. If you, you just isn't having you do that, you can just print them out. Another example that I have for you for ELA is that you can listen to your students read. These two, this one was on Seesaw. The students had to read each word and it was awesome for me to hear. I could listen to it in on my own time and I could see here which students were having issues reading those words or what students were able to move on. And what's also great about Seesaw is that the parents were able to hear it as well. The other example was a phonics sort. This one I actually purchased on Teachers Pay Teachers, so thank you to Dee Dee Wills. This one, one where the students were learning the concepts of why that makes the I sound or just the regular long I. This student had a little bit of issues, so I knew there was time for me to help and intervene. My science example here is that we were learning about plants' needs, and this example was found in the Seesaw Library. Students had to switch out or had to distinguish what which was a need and which was um, not a need between plans. Students that were able to get it, hooray. Students that weren't, we pulled together and be able to figure that out later. Teacher, I'm done. What do you do with these exit tickets once they come into you? Well, obviously the very first thing that you need to do is that you need to grade them. You need to see where the students had problems or where they didn't. So that brings me to step two. Who got it? Who doesn't have it? A lot of times I sort my exit tickets into who got it, who doesn't. And then I'm going to meet, step three, meet with those students that don't understand. Um, that can be done in a small group time like I had number four. Or maybe I can just quick pull them over when the students are doing a different activity, an independent activity. I'm also able to see trends over time. What students are constantly getting this concept and they are ready for a challenge, or which ones are not quite ready yet, and they need some more extra teaching. So how exit tickets helped me was that I was able to get that data that I so needed. I was able to help um, many students understand that concept where sometimes they would just kind of brush through. And especially like in math, I was thinking that many of my students understood the concept of the number before and number after, and they just didn't. I was able to see that through my exit tickets and they were able to do it. It was also a really great communicator to parents that I was able to say, hey, this is what your child needs help on. So I love this idea you're thinking to yourself, how do I get started, Erin? Well, the first thing I would do is to start small. Don't go all out. I would pick a subject that you feel most comfortable for. For me, that was math. And what I did was I went through each lesson and I wanted to see what each, what I really, really wanted my students to understand. And that was what the questions were about. And step three, that you work with your team. Get with your team, get with your PLC and talk about exit tickets and to share the load. So what I want you to do now is go out, get that meaningful data for your students and help support your students. You got this. Thank you so much for listening to this Ignite Talk. Feel free to contact me anytime. My email address is right there and I would love from hearing from you. Thanks everybody. Have a great time. Hi and welcome to Seesaw Connect. This is Student Voices Crafting Dyma Dynamic Student Made Newsletter with Seesaw. Welcome. My name is Amber Butel and I'm an ESL kindergarten teacher in Woodland District 50, Gurney, Illinois. I have been teaching for quite a while using Seesaw and I found that I had great connections with my parents and I was instantaneously telling them about what was happening in the day, making my traditional newsletter feel obsolete. At the same time, I teach ESL students, which means that my children speak different languages at home and I'm always looking for opportunities for them to have a voice and practice their English. This seemed like a great combination of things and the parents loved it and really enjoyed hearing from their children what they were doing during the day. I'd like to give you a quick how to get started doing these newsletters. I first looked at what I put in my traditional newsletter to give me a pathway to figure out how to make it an online thing that the kids could do. I still put in my 
um, heart words and my blends. And I also added some language arts, math, and ended with something that the kids really wanted to share. You can see I have several pages. One suggestion I do have is majority of our families look at Seesaw via their phone. So once you have your pathway all done, I would suggest looking at your phone to see what the parents are actually going to see. To see if maybe you have too many things on one page and you might do well making it two pages. I like my kids coloring and showing their um, pictures as opposed to taking them. So I would build a quick drawing box by making a square or whatever shape I wanted in white, making a copy of it using the three dots. And then the copy, I would change the color and then make it an outline and put it around so it had a crisp border so the kids knew exactly where they should be coloring. You could also add a quick text box to that so they know what to be putting in there. Since I started, <clears throat> Seesaw has added this great creative canvas frames, which you can put right into your um, newsletter and allows the kids to know exactly what they should be doing on that page so that they know exactly what you're looking for, a picture, text. I highly recommend that the last step on that is recording your journey, which you just start off by um, touching the record button. And as um, you go from page to page, it will join them together into making one small video that the parents can just touch. Now I do mine with the younger kids where I have them do some of the drawing, then I stop, we talk about it, um, and then we start recording and then I'll stop again and we'll um, repeat that several times so the parents aren't watching the kids actually doing the drawing. It also gives us a chance to talk about what we were looking for in that spot. Last thing I'd like to share with you is some handy tips that I found um, uh, to make their, your transition that much easier. One of my pitfalls was when I first started and I transitioned from traditional to student newsletter is I thought there had to be certain things that were put into the newsletter because that's what I would have put in had I been writing it. And I found that um, they, while the kids were the ones doing the talking, it was still me driving what was being put in there. Once I um, started asking more open-ended questions, like what do you remember during math or what was your favorite thing? I learned so much about um, what was happening in my classroom and what was important to my kids. So if you take nothing else, make sure you ask the open-ended questions. I will, with that said, I will say that, um, especially with the younger kids, I do do a pre-talk. I show them what we're going to be talking about or what we're going to be putting on this page. And I ask them the question. Then we kind of talk about, well, how can you represent that in a picture? And then I, we kind of go through some things that they might want to say. So my kids need a little bit more support in this. And I might be in there talking a little bit more on the end result that the parents see, just because my kids need a little bit more support um, in some of the places. The last thing I did, I just added this this year, I noticed that there were still some things that I needed to share with the parents. Like, we have a library lesson that changes every week, and I want them to know when they need to turn in their library books. So I would send them out a, a note on um, Seesaw Connect with the parents, and I started realizing that that's something that the kids can do too. So we came up with this newsflash thing. It was so um, popular that I'm actually going to add it to my job list next year as the reporter to share these um, cool flashes that happen in our classroom. I hope this has motivated you to start um, your own student-led newsletter in your classroom. Please reach out if you have any questions or something you'd like to share with me. And thank you so much for your time. P.S. Here is an example of one of our newsletters. Feel free to download it or use the QR code. Hello, welcome to Reignite Your District Seesaw Initiative. I'm Heather Solis, and I'm a digital learning coach in Texas. So we saw a sharp decline in the use of Seesaw after COVID. Teachers were using it during COVID, and that was their way that they were communicating with their students and sharing work with them. But once students returned to the classroom, they kind of took a step away from it. And so we asked ourselves, how could we increase our Seesaw usage to leverage the new features that came out last fall? And also, how could we encourage teachers to create impactful technology learning experiences for our students using Seesaw? So this is where we started. We had about 46% of our teachers were active the previous year. And then we had about 70% of our students active and 19% of our families active. And this is for the school year of 2022 to 2023. So we set goals for ourselves. 
we met with our CESAW rep, Julie, and we wanted to set goals around the implementation of CESAW in our district and kind of identify some action steps that we could take to achieve our goals. We really wanted to focus on instruction. We wanted to focus on assessment and data-driven decisions and accessible and differentiated learning. So the first thing we did was we created professional learning for our teachers, and we started that last summer for our summer PD. So we conducted these sessions in June and July, and we had, so you're new to Seesaw and level up Seesaw. And we started with the resources um, that Seesaw had provided to us and then kind of changed those or added to them, added to them to meet the needs of our teachers in our district. And then we offered the same sessions in our back to school PD in August, and we had a huge turnout. We had at least 75 teachers in each of our sessions. We offered them multiple times, and we actually had to bring more chairs in. Um, we really kind of sent out a lot of messaging around this professional learning before school ended the previous year and really promoted it over the summer and promoted all of the new features in Seesaw in our emails. Then we started a bite-sized PD session for Seesaw. We had other topics that we covered as well, but we wrote a grant to get funding to provide door prizes and snacks to our teachers. And then we offered just a bite-sized PD of about 10 minutes, um, maybe 15 minutes of information. And it was really just to hook them in, show them the features, um, get that FaceTime with them to get buy-in from them. And then we could meet with them as teams or individually to go in depth or meet their needs, kind of meet them where they were with Seesaw. And then we offered another session in February. We wanted to kind of take it to the next level. So we offered a session for um, using formative assessment to support responsive instruction. And we had a very small turnout to this, but um, it was some really great information that we got from Seesaw to help our teachers. We also sent weekly newsletters and always made sure to highlight Seesaw in those newsletters to give it its own spot each week to provide timely updates, um, the classroom dailies, holiday activities, or things we thought might be fitting for our teachers at that time of the year. We also um, implemented Seesaw through our curriculum integration. We created um, task guide assessments. We are a standards-based gradebook district. And so we created activities for our teachers, integrating Seesaw straight into the curriculum. So when they would go to those curriculum documents, they would find that information there and could click on the link that took them straight to our district library. We also did um, impactful technology integration. We had um, in our curriculum and instruction, we wrote activities for each of our nine weeks for grades um, K through five. And we would give teachers lesson plans straight to an activity that integrated technology into the curriculum they were teaching and always tried to be sure to include Seesaw activities as well. And really, I think what our year involved around was intentionality and, you know, being intentional about our purpose and our mission and what we wanted to accomplish with Seesaw. Our outcome was amazing. We had teachers increase um, active use from 46% to 68%. We had um, 119,248 items created by students in Seesaw, and we really saw all of our numbers increase. And so we had a 47% increase in teacher use, which is huge in one year. So our steps for next year is to really focus on increasing student engagement to provide professional learning around the new features and collections that are coming out and really leveling up our teachers and their use from going from maybe a beginning level to taking that next step and um, just increasing their usage and the way that they're using data from Seesaw. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you have a great school year. What a phenomenal uh, group of educators. I did add those bit.ly's to the handouts and all of these sessions will also be available on demand until November 3rd. So if you missed a link, you'll still be able to access all of those links. It's also kind of hard to manage. There's a lot of amazing links being shared. So we'll make sure that you have access to all of those um, as they're available on demand. Now, 
for a little bit of fun, we're going to do another giveaway. All right. I'm going to spin that giveaway and we're going to get two winners. Let's see who they are. Amazing. Cynthia and Lauren, your names are on the board. We will follow up with you early next week so you can claim your prize. There is absolutely nothing you need to do because I have all your information when you registered. Thank you all so much for joining. You do have a bit of time between your next session. You can go chat with other people. You can take a little break if you want. I know it normally is a t-shirt, like break. What is that, right? Um, but make sure to keep engaging because you can keep earning points on the leaderboard. We have more fantastic sessions coming up. And thank you so, so much for joining us. I'll see you soon in the next session. Bye.